Welcome to Positive Filter with your host, Fuller Wilkerson, a podcast that focuses on friends, family, health, and career with a little self-help along the way. Please join me in this journey for self-improvement, and I hope what I have to share will make you a better person, thus making the world a better place. I hope you enjoy the show. I hope you enjoy the show. I hope you enjoy the show. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's Philip Wilkerson back with another episode of Positive Filter. I'm joined by a special guest. Well, everyone is a special guest. I think everyone gets used to me saying that, but everyone that takes their time is a special guest to me. I'm joined by Mr. Junior Delgado. So we've met uh, in the world of professional development, following each other on LinkedIn. I I think we've been in the same room multiple times, but really not talk, you know, like large conferences, because I've been to Eastern A's conferences, but we really not, you know, dapped each other up and, and, and whatnot. But... Um, I connected with this this gentleman um, in the digital space, and I love what he's doing in regards to professional development. I love what he's doing in regards to connecting people, and I want to give him a mad shout out that he organized probably one of the most fun and engaging conferences that I've ever been in, which was straight virtual, but we're going to get into that later. But before I get into this episode, uh, Junior, uh, can you give the, the listeners uh, just a brief introduction of who you are? So thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And again, it's, it's nice to, to actually have the conversation, connect virtually, because um, we've done it in a, a whole bunch of different ways. And you're right, we've been in the same room at, at, at different Eastern Ace conferences. So uh, my pleasure to be here, Junior Delgado. I'm the director of the Career Center at Westfield State. Uh, I have been the director over 10 years now, uh, but I've worked in my office for a little over 20. Um, so I've been at Westfield State a long time. And it has been my honor to be here. It has been my honor to work and serve our students. And it's always about connecting our students. It's, it's working with our students to ensure that they connect to what I like to call life after Westfield and the opportunities that are out there for them as well. I am a, a, a Latinx or Latino brother. Yeah. I was born in Puerto Rico and brought to the United States as, as I believe a two or three year old. Um, and I, primarily live in the same area, which is Western Massachusetts. So we, that area is, people always equate Massachusetts and they always ask for Boston first. Yeah, yeah, I'm um, sorry. I, I was gonna, I was gonna be very naive and be like, I don't know any other place besides Boston. <laughs> so <laughs> we are, good. we are an hour and a half west of Boston. So we, we actually sit closer to Hartford, Connecticut. Mm-hmm. And we're about an hour and 15 minutes east of Albany, New York. And if anybody's ever been to the great state of Vermont with trees and you like peace, and, and tranquility. Uh, Vermont is about an hour north of where we are. So we, we, we always say we're at the crossroads of New England mm-hmm. um, and the weather here changes every single day. So, and, and just very interesting, you said you immigrated uh, from Puerto Rico, you know, large hubs, uh, you know, my Puerto Rican friends, large hubs live in like New York City. Is there a large Puerto Rican, um, I guess, you know, group in that, that Massachusetts area? Absolutely. So Boston has a large contingent. Um, Springfield, Massachusetts, which is the third largest city in the state of Mass, has that uh, that large population. That's right next to us. So we're about 25 minutes west of Springfield uh, and also the town directly next to us, which is Holyoke, Massachusetts. I believe their public schools now are about 85 percent Latinx. Mm, OK, that's good. to know. And that's, I'm learning new things because, you know, obviously you, you don't leave your bubble. I've been to Boston a few times because one of my best friends played football for Boston College, okay. um, but I've not explored. So this is a new conversation. So kind of pivoting and jumping, and we're going to go into the topic of networking. Can you just briefly uh, bring to that experience of how you went into the career development world, you know, for yourself, you know, like from a, as a student to um, your job? I share these funny stories because I think there are some funny stories and there are some life stories that go with it. And, and I've and in some other spaces, I've shared that one of the things that it's interesting, you don't know where life is going to take you. And as, as a teenager, I think the most pivotal thing that happened in my life was at that time, I'm going to go back and, and date myself here, was the 90s. And in the 90s, uh, there was significant unemployment, um, not to what we're seeing now, but there was. And, and uh, one of my parents, um, being Spanish speakers primarily and predominantly, uh, continued to be laid off over and over and over and over. So as a 14 and 15 year old, here I am, I'm the primary English speaker in the household, first generation, everything in the household from from high school to college, so forth. And I would get up at five in the morning and walk a mile to the store 
to get a newspaper because at that time, newspapers primarily had all the job postings and, and you're talking some newspapers have 10 to 20 pages of job postings. So thank goodness for the internet now. Thank goodness yeah. for some of those job search sites because it does make our lives a lot easier. Um, but that really fostered in me uh, the ability to help my family member. Um, I would go to some of the different organizations and actually fill out applications and help in that way, answer some of the questions, translate questions. And then years later, it, it's just so funny because I went through all these, I want to do this, this, and this. And what I really wanted to do coming out of high school is I wanted to be a hotel manager. I mean, not a lot of people know that, but, but what's funny is one of my professors was an actual hotel manager. And so I'm 18 years old and the person says, like, do you realize that sometimes I spend 90 plus hours a week and I have to sleep in the hotel? Jeez. Well, that hotel management dream died right there <laughs> oh, right. at 18 yeah. because I'm like, I'm not working 90 hours a week. And then that transitions into going back to what I thought was, was a passion and I wanted to work with, with kids. Mm -hmm. And that so happened that I came out of college and I worked as a high school teacher. Yeah. And from a high school teacher, I transitioned into the college space and I did admissions and from yeah. admissions and careers. And then so it's funny because I came back and, and when I got into the careers job and looking back, I'm like, wow, all that preparation at 13, 14, 15 years old served me well. I love that journey. And it's funny, I'm smiling right now uh, because I, I, I find a lot of transference from that is that I don't think a lot of, if we did a story about how people come into career services, I don't think anyone like wakes up one day and was like, that was my dream. You kind of fall into it. And similar to you, it kind of fell into it, the career development space by just wanting to help people and then get a degree. And then I, before you know it, I was interning at the career center. And then I was like, oh, I like this space. But it's just like, no one really falls into it at all. It's funny, it's, it's very interesting. I, I, I would actually, when I do these stories and talk about career, you know, this, this space of career development, I didn't go to my career center uh, at all in undergrad, at all. Like, I had never utilized it. And now I'm like, it's preaching the good word of career services, but it was like so interesting. So it's very interesting. I think if you, if you found out and you, and you polled people that are in this space, ask people how many people have never used their career center from, from so many of the professionals that we interact with. And I'm going to guarantee you it's a pretty high percentage. I would say that. I would say that too. And I would say, uh, I actually met someone who was like, this is my dream job out of high school. And I looked at them weird. I was like, yo, fool. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. Okay. Are you just saying this for your interview question? Like, you know, when they talk about the interview, I was like, all right. They trying to just kiss butt right now. Cause I know, I know good and well, no one woke up and said, I want to be in, in this space. But, um, <laughs> but I, I love what you said, uh, particularly, about uh, just connections and, and we said this offline is that a lot of this space um, especially networking was really how we got into this you know like, whether it was a mentor or someone that put us on and I think I, I love that you have something like life beyond Western right the life beyond that can you talk about how maybe your life beyond undergrad kind of like you said, you went into the, the education space, how that was like really pivotal for you becoming, you know, where you are now. And I think it's when you're, when you're, when you're of the traditional age, I think that 18 to 22 year olds, which is, I mean, colleges are changing. Our demographics are changing. We're certainly seeing students of every single age. And, but I think that that for that age group, and if anybody who's in their forties, fifties and sixties thinks back, I mean, making that decision as to what do I want to do in life, what do I want to do after I get out of college, it is very difficult. The transition is not only nerve wracking, it, it is anxiety prone for students. And I think that's where we have the privilege of working with these students and being able to share some of our life stories. And certainly we're not going to tell people what to do because we never tell students what to do. Um, but we provide stories, we provide connections. And, and that's the one thing that I think mm -hmm. I want to get across, that mm -hmm. the word networking is so misunderstood. Yes. Students have no idea what it means. It terrifies some students. Yes. And when I break it down with, with the students that we work with and, and here at Weston, and we talk to them, it's just a simple act of having a conversation. There you go. That's what it is. It's the simple act of having a conversation. So take, take and remove the word networking out. It's a simple act of having a conversation with people it's also, if you really look at what networking is, is myself or one of my team members introducing a student to someone else and saying, look, here's this great person who is in the media space. It's where you think you might want to go, or maybe you don't, but at least right now at, 
at 21, you think you want to go into this space. Let me have you have a conversation with this person, connect you, and then take it from there and develop that professional relationship. And so I think life after Westfield is a term that I, that I like using because it's, it's, it's about getting all of our students to start thinking about, look, college is only going to be two years for some, three for others, and at most maybe six or seven if you're on the extended plan. <laughs> yeah, let's keep it because life happens. I mean, there's, there's people that it takes a little bit longer. There's financial implications for mm-hmm. others. Mm-hmm. But life after Westfield is very, very short. And I think I, I laugh the most when I have my conversation with first-year students, and I say to them, look, you're going to blink an eye, wake up, and it's going to be the beginning of your senior year. And you're going to wonder what happened in between. And if you haven't had that preparation, if you haven't started to at least give some thought to this, you don't want to wake up at at the beginning of senior year and then go into full-blown panic mode because you didn't take any of the other steps or put some things in place. Uh, And then, again, we see this all the time on college campuses. We have to immediately go into crisis mode and start working with these students and say, all right, now we've got to take three additional years of career development advising and coaching and put it all into this last year to get you to start looking at opportunities, to get you to start having conversations. So I think at any college or university, using the term life at whatever, life after, whatever the name of your university or school is, is very important because it gets students to start thinking about, look, this is not gonna last forever. And we can't all be like that movie, I think was called Van Wilder. You can't stay in college for nine years yeah. and, and continue the party because it, it has to stop at some point. I love it. And you know, one of the things I I just circled this word and I thought about it was connections and conversations rather than networking. Because I'll I'll let you know, I I can't, I I don't like that term either because a a lot of it to me seems like business and sleazy business suits and business cards. And I try to really break it down. It's just building relationships, like establishing relationships and asking people questions. Like, Like you said, just asking simple questions with no sleazy sale. Like you're not really, when we think of networking, you're not really trying to you know gain or or get over on people or you know you know leverage this it's like literally like oh i see that you're doing something i'm interested in can i just ask you questions about how you got there and then i love how you said like sometimes after you ask those questions you're like oh no i don't want to do that you know it's very <laughs> like uh, thank you thank you shout out to you professor i ain't working 90, 90 hours so can you talk about like the some like that really breaking down that 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 mindset of really taking it away from, you know, that, that scariness and really going to conversations and, and just being your authentic self and, and building relationships. It, what, one of the things that, that I go one step further and, and, and students, I think, appreciate this, at least I hope they appreciate this, is that a lot of times the coaching aspect comes into play because they're not sure what types of questions to ask either. And so helping them break down some of these questions, uh, a lot of times, I mean, I, if, if, if I don't say this now, um, LinkedIn primarily is, is the space that we're, we're having our students fully engage in. And through LinkedIn, you're able to add that, that note feature. And so helping some of our students craft those notes mm-hmm. to make that initial connection, because I'm surprised and, and I'm not surprised when you mentioned the word informational interviews and students say, well, what is that? What do you mean by information interview? And then explain and they're like, oh, that makes great sense. But I think the other piece of it is they're like, all right, what about if we send out this note and somebody connects with me and then they want to talk? What what do I ask? Mm -hmm. And so I have a series of a couple of quick questions and I'm saying, well, you're not going to certainly keep the individual on for an hour on the phone. Mm -hmm. You you may not even keep them on a half an hour, but a couple of questions would be very simple. Thanking them for the time Mm -hmm. to speak with you. I mean, that's certainly those individuals are taking time out of their schedule. The other piece is asking them, what is it they truly value and like about the work that they're doing? Uh, The second question that I would say is ask them, what are their challenges? What are some of the challenges they face within that work? And then the last two questions I think are the most pivotal, which is one, asking that individual and saying, what is the best piece of advice that you can offer to someone who wants to enter the space that you are in right now? And then here comes the big one, which is, it's, it's, I call it the final kaboom that you're hitting them with is, is there anyone within your own network that you feel that I would benefit from having the same conversation? With? Oh. Because I tell students, you want to expand. You want to talk to others because not everyone is the same. There is a diversity of thought. There's, there's 
people have experiences, people are from different countries, people are from different states. And what one person in New England might think about the subject that you're asking them about, somebody from the South or somebody from the West might be very, very different. And so I think expanding that group of individuals and getting at somebody's circle of friends, again, without saying networking, getting at that circle of friends is what you really want. And so oh. we have to coach students sometimes to, to ask those questions because again, if I look back to myself as an 18 year old and as a first generation student, I had no idea what to ask anybody. I mean, I knew that I liked asking questions, but I had no idea what to ask. And so you mentioned this, which I think is, is, is we are instrumental in students' lives as career centers. Anybody on a college campus or external who serves as a mentor or a person who's in guidance, because mentor is, is a loaded word with a lot of different meanings, but I think somebody who can advise, that's important for our students, because if you just don't know, you don't know. I love it. I, man, you see me cheesing like crazy because I'm aligning. I said, boom, boom, boom. And I, I really, I solidified. That is really my home run question too, is that thank you so much. I'm really appreciative of your time. Do you know anyone else that would be interested in talking to me? And that's just expansion right there. And I, 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 usually, I usually do this, job. I say, uh, with the networking, when you write a well-crafted note, uh, it's just shooting your shot. What's the worst case scenario? I play it out with students. Oh, they don't answer me. Okay, what happens with your day? Nothing. What's the best case scenario? And I play that out with them. Well, they give me a couple minutes of their time. That's awesome. That's it. You know, play those out. And, uh, and, and uh, I, I was like, just geez, I was like, man, that is it. And it was funny because I've always been an extrovert. And someone came up to me and was like, wow, you're a really good networker. And I was like, I was just asking questions. And I think it was just conceptualizing that perception of what it really is. And then realizing that a lot of the students, and I, I do this with a lot of students, like, I try to say, wow, you're already really good at talking to people. Just just reframe it and think about these conversations this way, but you already had those natural skills of connecting with people. You are really like, I see how you talk to your friends. I see how you interact with your other student orgs on campus. Like you really already really good at this already. But it's like, I think one of the things I think is very intimidating, I pick particularly for people in a younger space or, or maybe in even non-traditional students is that a lot of people put the people that they're trying to network with on a pedestal and they don't remember that the person that they're trying to connect with at one point was in their shoes. And so Absolutely. I was like, yo, really try to humanize the person. Like, not, I still say come at them with deference and respect, but also like they're a human being just like you, you know, like, you know, uh, you can also ask normal questions in informational interviews like, how's your day? Or how, do you, uh, how are you feeling about COVID? You know, like it doesn't always have to be these loaded interview questions about the career topic. It could be like, oh man, this is really tough. Uh, but speaking about that, I know a lot of this link, uh, I think a lot of this interaction and connections, you know, uh, and I, I remember we was in a presentation where we were trying to get away from job fairs being like, you know, um, like student warehouses, but really at the end of the day, it's really just opportunities to network. Um, but it's really hard to do these connections in this digital space for some people. And so I wanted to pivot and talk about how are we really helping people have these conversations, these connections in a digital space? That's a great question. I, I think that's the, that's the one challenge that, that many college universities are facing in general, uh, and, but certainly in our space is career folks, uh, trying to connect our students because people for the most part, as much as, 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 and I'll say this, as much as people think that most students just want to sit behind a computer screen, um, we have found completely the opposite. We find that students crave that interaction. They want to talk to each other. I mean, I think when you look at the news now, the students that are getting in trouble is what? They were all together at parties <laughs> because they're craving interaction with one another. And so one of the ways that I think that, that we have worked is we're using two platforms, two vehicles. Certainly if you're a school that's fortunate enough to be able to buy some of the, the platforms uh, without mentioning any that connect alums to students. Um, but I'll, I'll go back to LinkedIn because it is a public platform and it's open to everybody. Um, and, the, and being able to, to have those students start simply because, again, there is a level of nervousness. I will say that there is a level of anxiousness. And I think the thought process for a student to say, no matter what non-traditional or traditional, of saying, I want to connect to that professional. Sometimes that might be very unrealistic, especially if you have a student who might be an introvert, um, mm -hmm. extroverts. Even extroverts will have a hard time with that. I don't know them, so I'm, I'm a little hesitant in connecting. Um, 
But I say in LinkedIn, using your school's alumni feature, because the one connection that you have to that alum is, you all sat in the same classrooms, you all walked the same halls, you hung out in the quad, you went to the gym, you used the athletic facilities, you had some of the same faculty members, and that allows you that at least that initial bind because then again, you connect with that alum, those same questions apply. Tell me about the work you're doing. Tell me about your, the folks. How can I connect with other individuals that, that, you, that you tend to connect with? And it tends to break down the level of what you said. It shows students that individuals are human beings. They're not these people that are on a high pedestal that I can't, it's, I can't talk to them. I can't get there. I'm too nervous. Um, so that's one way. I think the other way that, that is, is making it much better, some of these platforms that are doing the, the virtual career fairs, I really, really am excited about those virtual I want to say that the pieces that they're adding in that are one-to-one -one connects mm -hmm. because that is allowing students now to talk to a real person one-to-one -one and ask the question. So now I'm not standing in line waiting behind 50 people to get up there and be able to share my story and say for like one minute, here's who I am and let me tell you about me. Now I'm getting maybe two or three minutes or five minutes to have the one-on-one -on -one conversation and say, here's what I like about your organization. Here's where I see myself. In, in your space and here's why I want to work in this space and that's why I came to talk to you. Um, so those components that any organ, any company is adding into their virtual fair platforms that has the one-on-one -on -one connections, I think it's always been, been people have stayed away from that. I don't know why. Um, so I think if anything, COVID brought us this where now these virtual platforms are embedding the one-on-one -on -one connection and I think that's important for our students. And so this is, we're going to make it applicable to us we are in the same professional organization, Eastern A, shout out to them. Yeah. And you were on the committee to create, a, a, the, you know, really launch a conference. And I ain't gonna lie, I was so looking forward to Baltimore in person, looking forward to connecting on purpose. I, I, I tell people multiple times, like, I was not very um, engaged many years before, but I, I, I literally like wrote on my board, like, this is the year I was going to take full advantage of this and really sh like show up in a room loud and proud in, in Baltimore. And uh, that didn't happen. You know, obviously it didn't happen. <laughs> you know, um, so can you talk about that experience for you? Because you were on the other side playing and it's like really getting people invo uh, really in involved and really excited and then having to pivot yourself as an organizer. So I, it, and thank you for that question. And, and I, I want to say that I want to give credit to everyone that was involved because it wasn't a one person show. And, and Christine Falcone, if anybody knows her from St. Joseph University was my co was the other co-chair. And so I think like you, which you just expressed, Philip, which is everybody was disappointed. I think people look forward to the conference every year. They look forward to meeting in person, connecting, sharing about their career centers and saying, hey, what's new? What's different? What are some of the policies that you're putting in place? Because people tend to learn from one another um, because we all do something a little bit differently. And so if we can borrow from our colleagues, absolutely. And so we were looking forward to all year because we began prior in August. I mean, we began in August planning for that conference and we were excited. We even did a site visit to the conference center. I think that happened in, in November or October. So we went out to Baltimore, we checked everything out. Things were moving along. Um, we had our committees, eight committees that were in place. And so shout out to the committee of, of the virtual 2020 conference, best committee ever put together. I will say that. Yeah. And, and um, we had everything in place. And then as COVID took, took effect in March and we started to see other conferences that were canceling uh, in, place, in person meetings, we needed to make a decision. And uh, we met as a committee and we talked to the board and then the board of, of, of Eastern Ace made the decision uh, because the, the, the options were cancel and take a year off or let's try and do something virtually. And I can tell you, I think we met more this year for this virtual conference than any in-person committee has ever met because it seemed like it was twice, sometimes three times a week with calls or emails or, or uh, board meetings, committee meetings. And what we found is that once we made the change, it was finding a system that could work finding a system that would allow people to engage. And we settled on a Sullivan's, which is a new product. And a Sullivan's allowed us the opportunity. And then we had to go into looking at, all right, we have all these great, all these great sessions. And unfortunately, some of the sessions um, weren't able to happen. 
but we were able to also take those sessions and transition them throughout the year so that individuals can still take advantage of those sessions throughout the year for professional development through Eastern ACE. Um, I can tell you that the two speakers we had changed our opening and I believe our closing from early on. Uh, and then we were able to solidify two speakers, which I think the opener, uh, Dr. DeBingo, rocked the house. I mean, he definitely incredible. Uh, and then Dr. Fruit Day at the end as well, just hit it out of the park and, and solidified um, information that people were like, okay, how is this happening? And, and, and shared a lot of the, the future of the profession, the future of work, and people were excited. Um, and then the sessions that we had, we were able to offer two sessions per um, the booths. Mm -hmm. So within the uh, Sullivan's platform, there were booths that people could attend. They could still speak to exhibitors. And then we had, which we were most proud of, and, and, and I can say the affinity groups, which was something that was new to Eastern A. So shout out to Dr. Alicia Monroe and her team, uh, putting that together and bringing that, 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 that component, as well as after that conference ended, they were able to again meet up as, as a larger group for individuals to share within that space. I mean, I think people were happy because the more you log into the system, there was a leaderboard, people were able to play games. Um, in between all the sessions, there was the lobby that people could interact and ask questions. Um, the feedback overall, super, super, super positive. People were encouraged and said, you know, we didn't know, we weren't sure what we were gonna get. And, and the one thing that I think was even most encouraging is that we had just under 700 people sign up for the conference. So it was, it was a great experience, a lot of work, but please let's get back to in-person conferences. <laughs> yeah. <Please. laughs> yeah. And I was about to say like the whole thing, it was like a highlight reel. I mean, it was dope. I actually gonna lie. Like I, I was in the comments saying this show was great. Throwing my LinkedIn in the comments, you know, troll, not trolling, but you know what I mean? Like I do that all the time. I go to, I go to large events and throw my LinkedIn just to like, it's like, a net just to catch people. <laughs> I said, I have no shame. But one of the things that I was thinking about is like, what is one of the core things that you want to do in a virtual space? Like when you set up something in a virtual space, you're like, no matter what, I want these two or three, whatever, I need this to be in, embedded to have a good experience. Um, I don't know whether it's an authenticity or as you say with the, um, the career fairs for students, at least an opportunity for one-to-one -one or whatever. What were some things like, as a core group, before you even knew what platform you use, like we need to have this, some version of this in a virtual space. So for us, I think it came down to two things. I think it was, and it could be three, four things, but I think the two things that come to, to mind immediately would be to have a, a solid technical platform that could handle the bandwidth, that could handle the amount of individuals that would, that would certainly participate or collaborate throughout the whole conference. And the second part was, creating sessions that were relevant, creating topics that, that we could embed that, that talked about some of the topics that, that, that we're seeing right now within our own space, which is equity and inclusion for individuals, um, as well as some of the topics that are on the, on the career space and how some places are doing it better, working with, with, with particular populations. And so that to us was super important. Um, certainly because we weren't, we knew we weren't going to have the the in-person component, I think if I had to name three things, that was the next thing. Having genuine interaction between all of our members and non-members that joined us for the conference and having all these individuals be able to communicate, chat to each other, because I, I really, what I enjoyed was during all the sessions, the questions that people had, um, the comments back and forth that people were sharing, the resources. Um, so we wanted that to, we wanted to ensure that that continued to take place throughout the conference. So I think wasn't two things, but maybe three. Yeah. I'm sure so, if you ask the committee, there'd be like 10 more. <laughs> I, so what I'm hearing, and I, if I oversimplified it, is like logistics slash bandwidth, content, like meaningful content that people want to listen or learn, and then interaction. Absolutely. We can throw all those in, across the board for not only us as professionals, but also for our students. I'm assuming students would look for that as well, like something that can handle their bandwidth and, and their attendance something that they're looking forward to learning is the content and it's something that has an interactive piece because it, it, this is separate than just a zoom. Like, you, you know, we could do it a zoom, but you want to have somewhere where it's like uh, that one-on-one -on -one, as close as you can replicate pulling someone to the side and having side conversations or whatever conferences are, you know, which. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I think it, it worked. And like I said, it worked well. Um, it, it was an excellent platform and not that I, that I, you know, I'm not doing any promos for a Sullivan's, 
<laughs> for, I think for the purpose of what we needed, um, it, de it definitely was right on point. So, you know, obviously for you, I mean, obviously when, when you have to plan something or plan something with a team, were you able still to like, you know how it is, like, there's always the organizer, the party planner that don't get to enjoy the party. You feel me? Like, <laughs> yeah. like I told so, someone, I remember I used to joke, I was like, man, I am not, I am not playing, I retired from planning my friend get-togethers, and then my friends don't get together, and then I end up planning the friend get-together. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, always happens to me, man. Like, I'm like, I'm done. Like, I, like even during this COVID time, if I don't plan these Netflix parties or Zoom calls with my, my friends, my boys, it don't happen. But at the same time, I, I, I ain't going to lie, I still enjoy it. Because, like, after I plan it and it's working well, I can, like, take off that planner hat and really, like, okay, I ain't planning no more. I'm, it's already starting to go. Like, you know, and, and so did you get that feeling? Like, I, I really organized, I can relax. Or you're, like, always behind the scenes. Like, oh, my God, the cameras are not working. You know what I'm saying? There was a tremendous amount of, we were on. We were on. <laughs> so I can say that for Christine and myself. Um, and certainly uh, the, the association that works with us uh, and the leadership team, we were on the whole time. So from the morning when it first started all the way to the end of the day, there was no taking off the hat. There was no sitting back and relaxing <laughs> because <laughs> we had to ensure that every session was working. We had to ensure that the technical aspect was working. And then the crazy part, which I didn't say at the beginning, was then you throw into the mix that hurricane that came up the eastern seaboard. <laughs> And half of our presenters had internet pop problems at their house and they got knocked out. Some of our, our people that had signed up to participate in the conference couldn't because they didn't get power back for a week. Um, so it's like we were working against all these things. All now, the beauty of it is was that that the, the sessions are, are still available for 30 days on the platform. So if people did not take advantage of that, they can still go back and watch every one of the sessions. They can still see the commentary that people were making, the feedback. Um, so that is the beauty of that. So I think that I'm going to say early September will will come off the site, but no, no. Oh, yeah. I, just, I think, <laughs> I think when, it was, when it was finally done at the at the last session and we closed out with the clothing speaker, I was like, Whew. yeah, I'm glad this is this this is done because. Do you, it, do you think that's a difference between that? Because I, I know as a career uh, center director. I mean, there's still a little bit of opportunities to in in-person fairs or in-person events. You get to do that. Do you think that if this was in person, you think you might have had an opportunity to to breathe a little bit um, because um, it's different, or is it no? It's just regardless. Uh, if you plan, you plan that comes with the territory of planning. Yeah. See, because the, the other piece is that, that I that I also co-chair the 2017 conference in Niagara yeah. Falls. Yeah. And and the thing that I would share with anybody, which I think is is important. I mean, we we have a full bind that is scripted from beginning to end. And this year was a virtual binder that tells you exactly minute by minute everything that's going to happen every session. <laughs> and so from the time you show up, because the, the conference, if this were an in-person conference, the planners show up a day before the, the, the conference. And you still you still have things that need to be done the day before. And you're going minute to minute to minute. And you actually don't get to breathe until you're either in your car on the way home or on or you're on the plane ride on the way back okay. home. And that's <laughs> and that's when you're like, this is really over. And, okay. then you can, and then you can take a step back and then certainly then you start doing the evaluation and, and looking at people's comments and, and where can we be better to serve to serve for the next conference committee to, to provide them the data and information that says, here's some things you might want to consider for the next year. Um, but I think that, and I shared this with some of the team at Eastern, at Eastern Ace, and I said, look, I'm taking a break. I did 2017, 2020, and it went virtual. I need a five year, five to six year break because, <laughs> yeah. because it's a lot of work and and so my hope is that 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 conference next year is in person because i know the level of work that the two co the two co-chairs for next year if they have to go virtual yeah they're, they're in for a whirlwind it's a, it was it heavy as the head that wears the crown kind of thing like it's just the burden of leadership we're taking initiative is that a lot of times the leaders or people that organize such as the front even as small like i said even down to the birthday party You'd be like, damn, you're not even enjoying the birthday party, you know what I'm saying? Or a wedding planner, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, I think I think anyone with event planning or 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 it's like what I'm hearing is like when you have to organize a large gathering of people, you're so focused on their experience being top notch that like that is your focus. Like you really don't need to focus about your experience. You have to focus on the experience of others until like you say you're back in your car or whatever. And it could go from I think it can go from weddings to family, uh uh, what's it called, family reunions. 
to conferences for your frat and all these different things. So uh, you're kind of solidifying that what, even in my little subcommittee, I'm still, I ain't gonna lie, I'm still gonna try to turn up <laughs> and like and enjoy it myself. <laughs> but also I have to also know that, that it's like game on, uh, it's, this is go time and you have to really be ready Absolutely. in the moment. And the, pe- and the people that serve in these roles, because you have all these committee members, they take it very, very seriously. Now, certainly in this planning, one of the, one of the things I'll, I'll allude back to what you mentioned earlier, uh, when we were looking at this to transition from in-person to, to virtual, you're not going to be able to have everything. And so that's one of the things that, that we were discussing. Like, There's going to be things that are going to be cut out from the programming, and then you're going to have to use some of those committee members to retool and, and, and be flexible and, and help on another committee. And, and so, you know, one of the things we made, the decisions we made early on, like we, we wanted some sort of entertainment or music or somebody's like, oh, well, maybe we can have a DJ just playing live music. But at the end of the day, what the committee decided was people are going to be staring at a computer screen all day long. Do they then want to get back on again with all their evening responsibilities to listen to a DJ play live music? And so we felt like probably not. And then the other piece of it, which I think we, nobody talks about this because this is the challenge. While you're doing a virtual conference, people are still tied down doing their work in between sessions. So, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't that true, that true where you're in a, in a person, when, when you're person to person, you're leaving for a day or two days, however long you interact with the conference and you get the opportunity to just focus on sessions, just having conversations with individuals saying, look, here's, here's an issue we're experiencing. What have you done in your place? I mean, that's the one thing that even myself and the co-chair, Christine, were talking like in between these sessions, we're also doing work. We're answering emails um, for, for So we were doing double duty throughout the, throughout the two days as well. And there were many others that expressed that same sentiment. I wish it was in person because I wanted to focus so much on some of the other work that I have to do. I love it. So I think we, we hit a good point. Uh, I, I always surprised that people have listened to my podcast before. Uh, we got my segment coming up called Shot for Shot. I don't know if you heard of it. Uh, where I get to ask you a random question, you get to ask me a random question, as related or not. You want to go first, or I'll go first. Uh, I'll go first. Okay. So, so the random question is this. Do you see yourself staying in the career field or this career space for at least the next 10 years? Uh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know, man. My interest, uh, and that's a hard no. I don't, it's not a hard no. It's a flexible no. I do know this. I will say this. Um, in the next 10 years, regardless of that, and, and not high, uh, higher ed space, yes. Um, I do see myself somewhere in higher education, students, learning, academia, working with kids, students. Uh, that, that is where my passion lies. Um, but I, I've done everything under the sun in higher ed. I've worked in admissions. I've worked in um, financial aid. I worked in co- career services. And I, I, ideally, my best experience has been in career services. But also, I don't want to tie myself down to only career services as a space I want to be in. And, and so I've also dabbled in different opportunities outside of my office, still in higher ed, whether that's well-being or whether that's working with a student group. You know, shout out to the alphas on campus, shout out to the NWCP. Um, but I can say without a, a, a doubt, a very strong definitive that it's going to be in higher ed. That is, that is, my, that is my community. Now, whether it's in career services, I don't know. You know, I, I, it's it's. I, I love the I love the aspect that career services, um, especially my office, is just very organized. Uh, this is uh, one of the things that you cannot not disregard within a career is that the professional development for people that work in career services is like no other. Because while we preach it to other people, we try to take advantage of it for ourselves. More than I think, more than any any division. I've seen across campus, we are really like, we are practicing what we preach. Like we're talking about you developing yourself as a leader and all this stuff and professional development and training and all this stuff. We get a lot of that ourselves. Uh, we get association memberships ourselves. I was like, I didn't realize how, how much of a blessing that is. So, you know, I love it. Like I, I, I have said this, like I have grown as a, not only a professional, but as a person being in my office because of the focus on being a better person that they make it like they, we're training like diversity and inclusion we've been doing and i say we're experts in it but we've been doing learning at least you know learning um and, you know subject we're not subject matter experts by any means you know um but we're learning as well we're, we're continuously growing the the 
uh, our, our supervisor, our, our director says, I want you to go out to these conferences. And sometimes she's like, I even want you to go to conferences that are not career services related, but industry focused, like, you know, National Podcasters Association. Go to that conference because while it's not, you know, your career, I want you to bring that knowledge to the students about that industry. So it's just crazy. I can't, I can't deny that. But uh, I don't know, man. My Tahiti, I picture my Tahiti when I told you that, what, what I picture for my future, my, my future, my Tahiti, it still has students when I close my eyes. It still has talking a lot like I'm doing right now. It might have, sometimes I have the dream of talking in front of large audiences. That's in my Tahiti somewhere. Um, I don't know, the office, like a cubicle, not really. I don't think that's in my Tahiti. <laughs> I don't think that's ever been in my Tahiti. You know, so shout out, like, no offense to my bosses, but like, I never thought of cubicle life or office life. I had this, even when I worked in career services, sometimes I take moments to walk around, like, every, you know, couple, like, work really hard and, and then just get out my desk and take laps to see what the campus looks like. I love the, I love college. I think I'm, I got the Peter Pan syndrome. I stayed in college forever. <laughs> I can't, I can't leave it. So I love it. So I, here's my random question for you. And I don't know, uh, this is going to be released a little bit later. I don't know, maybe September, October. I don't know. But we are watching bubble basketball right now. Uh, your Celtics are in it. I'm going to assume that you're a Celtics fan. I, I, I don't know. I, I think. Assume correctly. <laughs> yeah, I think. What? Okay. Uh, this is twofold. One is, what do you think the Celtics need to do to actually win a championship? That's one. And two, out of all the Bostontonian sports, which one is your favorite to watch? So this, this is interesting. So, and I'll share this because it, 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 it is, it, people find this to be so random. But what happens is, so I am a Celtics fan. I am a Patriots fan. I tend to like hockey, so I'm a Bruins fan. But I'm not a Red Sox fan. Oh, oh. I, I'm a Yankees fan. And so what I tell people is, and people are like, how does that even happen? And so what happens is that when we came from, from Puerto Rico as a kid, the only team that, that my family would watch was the Yankees. So I grew up as a Yankees fan. And so in Western Massachusetts, because we sit so close to Connecticut, we're so divided as an area because you have half Yankee and you have half diehard Red Sox fans. Um, and so that's always been this way in Western Massachusetts through Connecticut. Um, so I'm a Yankees fan Ooh. on the baseball side. But my favorite sport that I, that I would say is really basketball because I was also a basketball coach here at West Hill for 10 years uh, and, I, and and on the men's side. And one of the things that I think that, that to me that I enjoy, I like pro sports, but I'm 100% a college sports junkie. Um, my favorite college sport, and and I'll tell you this, it, see, everything always connects the pieces. And so college football is my favorite, absolute favorite. Probably as close second is, is, is basketball. Um, but college football, because of the atmosphere, the stadiums, the energy, um, and especially the tailgates. And so when I tell people my team that I like, people are like, how do you even, so I am a Notre Dame fighting Irish fan. Mm. People are like, how's that possible? So, and it's very, very simple. So in my household, uh, one of my siblings um, is a lifelong Michigan fan. And people say, well, how is that even possible again? Because you, you two are from Western Massachusetts. Why are you not a UConn fan? Why are you not a UMass? And I like UMass, don't get me wrong. Uh, but when we were kids, because we were not a family from a lot of means, um, we had free television, similar mm -hmm. to what we have now. And the two teams that are on TV all the time on, on NBC and ABC, we're Notre Dame in Michigan. And so when you grew up watching that, because there are no other stations, um, my brother went one way and I went the other way. And that. so, you know, we, we, we kill each other all the time about that stuff. We, we harass each other all the time about those two teams because, again, they've played each other, those two teams, and won, some years they've won and some years we've won. And, again, so that, that's one of those things. But to answer your question about the Celtics, what do they need to win another championship? I think they need to be to be gelling at a, at a high consistency. Um, and the biggest thing that which I think with any team is they need to be injury free. And so right now Hayward's out again. They've got a couple of pieces that are still banged up. Uh, I, do I still think I mean, they have the shooting and, and, and the other part is some of those young guys need a little bit more maturity because I think they've got some stars in the making. Um, and when they can put those pieces together, I think that they'll be unstoppable and, and 
that's no disrespect to the Lakers or any of the other teams <laughs> uh, yeah. with LeBron and that whole crew and, and the Sixers that I think we've been doing some damage to lately. Yes. But again, I love it. I love that story. You're just like my best friend, Hillard. Uh, he, he immigrated from Jamaica and he immigrated in, uh, in the nineties, uh, in the second grade. And guess who was the team winning all the NFL championships when he moved? The Dallas Cowboys. So my, man, so my man, we live in the DMV and it's a similar thing, man. It's like there's a there is a whole community of Dallas fans against the what we call right now the Washington Football Club. <laughs> until they got a new name. And so uh I was born into the Washington Football Club fandom. I'm using their new name now because you know, respect. And uh we we butt heads and joke with it. And I was like, I wish my dad would, as I'm a military brat, I was like, I wish my dad was stationed anywhere else. Then here, I would have been stuck with this team. Um, but I find, that, I find that very interesting. It's like usually with sports, it's so ingrained to the watching experience rather than where you lived. Like who would you watch it with your family? Or like my connection, I'm like, I'm stuck with it because my dad was in it. And I watched the, more, I watched the sports with my dad. It was, we was rah-rah together. Um, so I really like that story. Thank you for sharing. And also, I, I read a lot. Uh, additionally, um, college, college tailgating is way more fun. Now we don't have that as much at JMU, but I went to uh, I went to a UGA game down south, and anything in the SEC take it to the next level. I've never been to a tailgate like that on that's crazy a UGA game. And so, have you ever been to a Notre Dame game? Do you know what's funny? Never. That's on the bucket list to get okay, out to well, Notre yeah, Dame. Yeah. I'm pretty sure they turn up too. I have one of my neighbors. I'm gonna ask her. Uh, my my yeah. neighbor Rebecca. She she went to her and her husband are alum at Notre Dame, but I'm assuming you know. I've been to Michigan with my brother. Oh, we've, tail, we've tailgated that about five times. And wow, so was, okay, Ann Arbor. Ann Arbor. And so what's funny is that one year um, UMass Amherst was playing Michigan. So this was going back probably about 10 years or so. And their game was a, a 12, 12 or a noon game. We got to watch that game and tailgate that. And then at night in the evening, uh, Notre Dame was at Michigan State. So we were able to then get in the car in the afternoon and go up to Michigan State and tailgate. And no disrespect to the Michigan fans, because, again, I have no love for that football squad. Um, but the, the fans at Michigan State tailgate much, much more than the fans at, at the University of Michigan. Uh oh, I, they, I, go, I, they go hard. They go hard at Michigan State. I might have to send this episode specifically to my good friends, Amanda and her mom, who are big Michigan State Spartans fans. And they would yeah. love to hear, they would love hearing that. I think they would even, I would even probably timestamp this. So you don't have to listen to the episode. Just listen to this part where someone <laughs> randomly show some love. Well, it's been a pleasure, Junior. I really enjoyed having you on the podcast. Um, this is just wonderful. I think I was smiling and cheesing because it was like so many things you were hitting on were things that I, I speak about with my students, but also just things I identify so this is the portion of the show. Um, shout outs and plugs. Uh, shout outs, show love to anyone, anyone, brothers, family, anyone, show yeah. love. And then plugs where people can find you or connect with you, whether it's your LinkedIn, whatever you feel comfortable with. Yeah. So Absolutely. I'll keep my mouth shut. Shout outs and plugs. So first of all, uh, definitely uh, to, to the whole career space community, big shout out uh, to my immediate family, um, to my little one, to my wife, big shout out. Um, I wouldn't be where I am today without them. And, and I want to say to all my colleagues and friends, shout out, thank you for, for support, um, for the individuals that do work with students every day on your college campuses. Um, I want to definitely shout you out and appreciate you because uh, this is the generation and these are the individuals that will take over the workforce and lead us moving forward. And so I want to shout out to everyone and just appreciative and honored to have the opportunity to work where I work. Um, so that to me is, is very important when, when um, you're thankful for the things that you have, you're thankful for the things that you've been given and, and you get another day. Um, that's important as well. And uh, one of the things that I always share with everybody, if, if, if I'm on LinkedIn extensively, I use LinkedIn. So uh, you can find me at Junior Delgado. Um, I am not the Junior Delgado that was the reggae singer from Jamaica. <laughs> that comes up all the time. <laughs> Um, so it's funny because he did pass away a few years back. So people are like, aren't you dead? Um, so <laughs> man, reincarnation, man, like Pac, yeah. Pac's still alive though. Pac's probably so, in Puerto Rico. Probably, know, probably hanging on the beach scene that I have behind me, of yeah. course. So <laughs> that's, the theory, then, that's the theory right now, but go ahead. Absolutely. And then any, um, uh, I'm, I'm on Instagram and I'm on Twitter and it's Junior Delgado 38. And so, uh, what you'll find on my Twitter and what you'll find on my 
Instagram is that that I choose to to keep it around West Hill State University um, as to many of our events um, to highlight our students. Um, certainly some of my professional activities I highlight on there. And then on Twitter as well, I like to retweet because there are so many people that have so much knowledge and things that I learn every day from individuals and being able to retweet and share those out. And then liking all that people are doing on their campuses and, and resources for our students. And again, the future is here right now on our college campuses and being able to support and help them and lead the way and then ensuring 100% that everything, and I will say this very strongly, that everything for every one of our students, especially our students of color, is equitable and inclusive because I think that that is important. And, I, and, and as a person of color, if I don't say that, um, then I'm not being true to who I am. I love it, man. You bring yourself, man. We talk about that, you know, uh, black and Latinx, black and brown, all those people, man. Uh, we have, I, I believe we have a responsibility to not only um, help all students, but also particularly, um, I, I find a charge to to use our voice to show students of color, you know, that they have uh, a voice as us and adults and a support and, and someone that advocates for them, as well as just someone to be a resource. You know, you don't know how many times on campus I've gotten questions that have nothing to do with career services because they see the sole black man on campus. Uh, financial aid, I, don't, I mean, and I don't answer it. I ain't gonna lie. Like, so I don't give misinformation. I kind of make sure I connect point guard, as they say, but I definitely hold that responsibility very important to me uh, to be a support for students of color um, and bring that because that's who I am. Uh, this has like been that. great. Oh, this has been great. I mean, I'm smiling and cheesing. This has really uh, reinvigorated my weekend. Um, there's been a great episode, and so I encourage you all to follow up with Junior on all his different things that he'll share out, or I'll share out in the show notes. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, sharing positivity it. is the thing we got to do, and we're out. Perfect. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Positive Filter, a podcast that focuses on family, friends, career, with a little self-help along the way. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with your family and friends and like the Facebook page, Spreading Positivity of Movement. Thanks for listening.